and welcome to the Doofcast, a film and TV podcast from Doof Media. My name is Scott Daly, and joining me, as always, the gorilla to my chimp, it's Mr. Matt Freeman. How's it going today, Matt? Oh, um, you know, thanks for letting me out of my cage, first of all. You're, you're welcome. You're welcome. Appreciate that. Um, and I'm happy to, you know, just be in your corner and happy to be part of, of this. And if you need me to jump at a helicopter, I'm here for you. Yeah, please do. Um, also push a bus for me if you could. That'd be great. I can do that. I can do that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Appreciate that. Glad we're working together on this. Yeah. Yeah. This week on the show, Deconstructing Apes continues with the seventh film in the Planet of the Apes franchise, the 2013 reboot, again, Rise of the Planet of the Apes. But this one's good. Shocker. Surprise. This is a good one. Yeah, this is a good one. This is a, <laughs> a, a just a little, little preface here. Better than I remembered. I agree. And I want to get into that for sure. sure. Um yeah. So yeah, that's what this episode is going to be about. Uh, then I think we're going to wrap everything up at the end with me just giving you and perhaps our, our audience a movie recommendation because occasionally these days, that rarely Matt, but occasionally I watch movies not for the show. Um, so I have to talk about them on the show, which is I think in my contract. So uh, that happened and I want to talk about it. Sounds good. But before that, we've got our main event. Let's talk all about Rise of the Planet of the apes we're talking about huge potential for millions of people our therapy enables the brain to repair itself we call it the cure i want you to start testing on chimps asap we test one subject i want to make sure it's stable i designed the 112 for repair the Caesar's gone way beyond that. You mean increased intelligence? The skills that far exceed that of a human counterpart. Matt, what is this movie about? A substance designed to help the brain repair itself gives advanced intelligence to a chimpanzee who leads an ape uprising. This movie was written by Rick Jaffa and Amanda Silver. It was directed by Rupert Wyatt. It stars James Franco, John Lithgow, and of course, Andy Serkis. In the first of many portrayals of the ape Caesar. Matt, you said you liked this better than you were expecting. What did you think of Rise of the Planet of the Apes? I think this is such a fun movie. Um, this is just one of those movies where it's 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 the it's the justification for doing reboots, where it's like mm -hmm. you look back at an old property and and some artistic mind is like, you know. I see how to take these elements from across these two or three movies in this in this apes series that was kind of this this sprawling mangy thing that was very much of its time and I see how to refactor this into a tight reasonably lengthed movie with taking advantage of modern special effects to do something they couldn't do back then tell a really good story make it really fun make you really care about what's happening to this to this ape character uh and then just execute really well i i think it's a really i honestly think this is just like an actually really good movie um and i'm happy to like i'm actually looking forward to talking about it because this is one where i think we're just going to be pretty much talking about how awesome it was <laughs> <laughs> the whole time which is you know i like it when we get to do that obviously what did you think yeah. about this movie? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm right in agreement with you on that one. Um, I, I I think like the the six movies leading up to this one have either just been like bad movies or like good movies in an interesting way. Like, you know, I really liked the first Planet of the Apes. I really liked Beneath Planet of the Apes for its aud aud audaciousness. Um, but I feel like I've always had like a an asterisk next to I like this movie for every one of those films. Um, this is the first one that I really just completely agree with you is just like a really, really solid movie. And that's what I felt the entire time I was watching this movie. I was just like, man, this is good. Like I'm, I'm in, I'm into this. Like I'm loving these characters. I'm committed. I'm emotionally invested with this poor chimpanzee and even with James Franco and his, his plot line with his father. Um, and then these, the other chimps and, and orangutans and and gorillas that we don't really ever get named but you feel for them too it all just works very very well 
And the thing that surprised me the most is this is the first film in what was originally a trilogy and then they made a new movie this year, but it's kind of called like the Matt Reeves Apes trilogy. Um, but with the caveat that actually he only directed the second two films in, in the series, uh, he did not direct this first one. And I had this memory of this being the weakest of the three. And I justified that in my head by, oh, well, it's the one that Matt Reeves didn't direct. So that's OK. It, of course, it's going to be the weakest in the three. Matt Reeves is a genius and uh, he made the two really good movies. And this is just the OK movie. But no, man, this movie is really good. <laughs> like it yeah. just, it just, it really is. I, I'm, I'm totally with you on this. Like I, I don't have very many bad things, if any, to say about this film. I think it just kind of works from minute one to the the very end of the movie. Yeah, it's it's weird because before I rewatched it in preparation for this discussion, I had this concept in my mind that it like suffered from pacing problems, or or, or that it like. That, that maybe the character work was a little thin. And then I watched it this time and I was like, I don't know what I, I don't know why I thought that. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know why that was a, a, a cached expectation in my brain. Like it, it's quite, quite well paced. It, it trades off, you know, against the fact that you, you have to pass kind of a lot of time to say that we're going to go from, you know, just prior to the birth of this ape to him being, you know, a, a mature full-grown ape and and uh, just a lot of stuff is happening and so that's not a that's not a pacing problem that's just the necessity of the story and and i think it does it convincingly i think this is one of those one of those rare movies really where you take a character and you start with them as a, a, a little child and then you follow them into adulthood and you actually watch their coming of age and it's and it's awesome. Like you, you see the the change in Caesar as a character as he goes through these life events. Like it's it's very good storytelling. Um, mm-hmm. he, he goes from being this innocent little chimpanzee to becoming disillusioned with you know his place in the world to ultimately you know making a mistake and being locked up in this preserve and then kind of finding a new sense of identity with these other chimps and, and you're again, like kind of miraculous because this is all done non-verbally. Yeah. We, yeah. Haven't, <laughs> we, we haven't said Andy circus yet, but Andy circus is like a gift from God. <laughs> for, yeah. Like um, just in general, <laughs> but, but, but here <laughs> yeah. also um, uh, just, just really carries everything. I, I think. Uh, uh, and, and then of course, you know, him in conjunction with the special effects being where they were at this period in time. It's just like, mm-hmm. yeah, it's great. It's just great. You never, you, you basically never even think about the fact that this is special effects. You're just kind of in the movie. Yeah. I, and I, I think like the thing that works so much for me about the, the kind of the emotional stakes of this thing is, is you are both, I think like swelling with pride as Caesar like takes his role and takes center stage and like becomes essentially the king of all these apes um, <clears throat> by the end of the movie. But there is this real sense of tragedy with him and his relationship with Franco, right? Like yeah. <clears throat> there's multiple moments in the movie where you're just kind of like, Oh, <laughs> like, like when he first comes to take him home from the, the uh, preserve he's been forced to go to and Caesar shuts the door on him. Yeah. And it's this, this moment of, Oh, there's something lost here forever. Like Mm -hmm. there's something we can never return to. Um, And that pays off, I think, beautifully at the end where Franco like essentially lets him go. Um, It's it's a great it's a great repeating beat uh, that reflects the first time they go into the Redwood Forest and he asks Franco permission before he climbs the tree. And this time there is no need to do that. He just. Mm -hmm does it like I, I loved that beat um but yeah i mean like that, like your, your emotions are conflicted because you're so invested in these characters and you want them to be a family together you, despite despite everything in the movie telling you that uh, uh, like apes are not pets um mm-hmm. you you want them to be together as a family like you see and that's like one of the benefits of the slow deliberate pacing uh, slow is probably the wrong word just deliberate that we get to spend so much time with this character and these characters in the early part of the movie, before we get into the events that lead to our climax, that we see them as a family. We see him and, and, and Franco and John Lithgow and and even the, the girlfriend character that becomes part of the family. Like we get to experience life with them all together. And so as things start to shift into this necessary new life for Caesar, it is, 
this sense of joy and sense of loss simultaneously. And I think that's what makes the emotional stakes of the the film really resonate, at least with me. Yeah. I, I think some of the genius of the film is in understanding, like, what is it that's compelling about the whole Planet of the Apes concept? While this is not technically, I mean, this is a Planet of the Apes movie in the sense that it's of the Planet of the Apes franchise, but like, this is just Earth. This is just our world. And then yeah. there's a monkey who becomes smart. So it, it's, I think we talked about this before, but it's sort of borrowing various elements from various of the other movies. But centrally, I think, um, uh, what is it? Conquest of the Planet of the Apes is the one where, where Caesar um, takes over. Yep, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but like, done super differently obviously mm-hmm. but um you know, some would d- say done well <laughs> d- done well and also i think borrowing like not so so yeah probably the, the the movie's weakest and sort of campiest moments are when it goes for the overt reference mm-hmm. to, to tom felton saying get your paws off me you damn dirty ape yeah um Although, although I will say that is immediately followed with like the most badass moment in the movie <laughs> where, <laughs> where Caesar says, no, um, which is just uh, like it's it's fulfilling a promise that was made 40 years ago yeah. when that story was first told in that movie. And and we just never got that moment mm-hmm. in a satisfactory way. And mm-hmm. it's it's so good. It's so good. It's so good. So, so, but what I was, what I was heading toward is, is saying like, they understood what's good about the idea of an underdog uh, mm-hmm. in, in a, in a brutally unfair and unjust system who, who is treated as subhuman and has got to figure out how to get out of the situation through, through wit and, and subterfuge, which is the position Taylor was in, in the first movie, but here yeah, it's easier. Yep. <laughs> and, and you're, and you're empathizing with the ape character and you're kind of like, man, those humans are, are, are assholes. It, like, like you're, the, the movie so, so totally turns you against the humans. <laughs> uh, I, I've, I've always loved that about the movie where I'm just like, you know, they're, they're, they're destroying the, the cops on the bridge and you're like, yeah, and you're like, wait a second. <laughs> it's, it's great. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think it is it is unfortunate that the court assigned Caesar to the world's worst uh-huh. uh, ape <laughs> uh, preserve ever. Like this is this is a truly awful place. Of course, Draco Malfoy happens to work there. Mm-hmm. Um, and and William Stryker, just the worst, <laughs> mon- most monstrous people in the world just happen uh-huh. to be running this 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 place but i mean that does create great stakes and drama um i mean i think you're right that this movie turns you on the humans but what i kind of like about this is that it's very clear that not all humans are the bad guys but all humans have to learn a lesson regardless like you have the evil ones that treat these animals as less than animals and then you have people like franco's character who love caesar and care for caesar but also still are not really seeing him as who he is now which is a person Mm -hmm. um and and deserves to be treated as such and so it's everyone kind of learning this lesson simultaneously um while also simultaneously ending their entire race by releasing a super virus but you know you know that happens yeah that's just par for the course in in, in (laughs) any any sort of biotech lab where you're doing uh uh, experiments on chimp brains Mm -hmm. um yeah Yeah, it's interesting you let your stupid mask fall off and then you are just sent home (laughs) stupid that's 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 uh yeah that's not reminiscent of anything that has happened since the movie came out no no see up. all of our labs yeah. in the real world have very very strong controls to prevent things like this from ever happening yeah thank god yes yeah, it's, it's interesting I, I was thinking about like franco's performance and um it, it's funny because i felt like a moment of like a, annoyance at like the way franco played the character and then and then i kind of was like well like let me step back for a second and be like well that's that's just this character is he he does have this like paternalistic um attitude towards caesar consistently where he sees caesar as his his pet prod i mean caesar is sort of his his kid he 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 says he's he says that he's caesar's father i think he i think he genuinely loves caesar but also he has this immensely paternalistic and superior attitude towards caesar where yeah every every like feat that caesar accomplishes is is sort of his own feat and and it was like even at the very end when he's like 
you know shouting for caesar to go it's like hey man caesar was going already you don't yeah he's not doing it because you're shouting it and um i thought that was an interesting reaction that i had to to his character yeah i agree with that i mean there is no kind of salvaging this relationship and it's not it's not as if james franco is evil or wrong or, or bad he's just not ready for what caesar was becoming um mm. i mean there is like a general m- metaphor towards parenthood here i mm-hmm. think like this is this is essentially his child uh l- l- metaphorically but also kind of literally he created him like he like he would not have been he would not have become a personified ape without the assistance of franco right mm-hmm. and so this this necessity to watch as your child grows beyond you um and and becomes better than you and becomes a person a person with their own wants and needs and you can't control them you can't keep them locked up you have to you have to let them go and flourish and uh, take over the world yeah yeah you have to i mean <laughs> I mean, I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree that that's, that's also in there. There's, there's so many, yeah, there's so many, it's just such good writing to understand all of the sort of buttons that you can press with a story like this. Um, and, and, and I, I don't think they failed to press any of them. It's, uh, it, it is like, we talked about in the the Tim Burton movie how we just felt like this movie was about nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the movie wasn't really interested in saying anything. This movie, on the other hand, I think is saying so many things. Mm-hmm. Like it it is it is doing the classic Planet of the Apes thing, where it is kind of talking about humanity and our uh, our propensity to destroy ourselves. I, I very much enjoy that. Like you can kind of um, track humans fears of self-destruction through the decades by watching this franchise Mm -hmm. and seeing that you know where it's not nuclear weapons anymore by by 2013 what we're worried about most is is uh out of control science that that leads us to destroy ourselves Mm -hmm. um and it's specifically out of control science in in pursuit of of those sweet sweet profits because yeah it's it's sort of the the unholy marriage between um this ambitious scientist and this money hungry capitalist to, that is driving the the you know, the destructive machine here yeah yeah at, at, at the the original intent of doing something good and helpful like Al- alzheimer's is a disgusting horrible disease that um i, ca- I can't imagine there's not many things worse disease wise mm-hmm. in this in this world and anyone that says they can cure that i would support wholeheartedly but yeah mm-hmm. this this mix of genuine altruism with capitalistic desire for for money 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 uh leads to this this destruction of uh mm-hmm. the the inability to to let go like that is part that is part of what motivates franco right is his father is dying and mm-hmm. he doesn't want to let him go and he refuses to let him go and uh instead he kills the, the whole the whole world oops yeah but then they were replaced by the the peaceful monkeys which are- yeah and nothing bad ever happened ever again yeah um i i do like that it's it's like there isn't i think there was in the 70s the 60s and 70s movies this undercurrent of like th- this maybe we had it coming and maybe maybe they'll do better mm-hmm. um and I, I that's not really present in this movie i don't mm-hmm. think um and i'm not saying it won't be present in the later movies but that's not really a focus of this movie is like it's not about whether whether uh, intelligent apes are going to be better humans than humans it's just they deserve their own place in the world yeah um it's just like it it, it's it's immaterial whether they're going to be better or worse than us they exist and should get a place um Mm -hmm. Yeah, they 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 simply deserve to be free. It, it, yeah. yeah, it's 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 all it's all just based on engendering empathy for them, which is yeah very easy to do. Um, even the scary ones, even <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it's funny, funny you say that. I was just gonna I was just gonna mention Koba, I believe, um, who who I believe becomes like a a major character in, in the yeah. later movies and antagonist in the later movies for sure. But like. In this movie, so so setting that aside, it's interesting because I know I know that, and yet I want to set aside the character and just talk about Koba in this movie because like he's horribly scarred. Like, like again, great like visual storytelling where you see that Koba is horribly scarred, and you see this like sort of calculating, patient, watching attitude, and you're like, this chimp has been through some shit, 
and hates these humans almost certainly with justification. Yeah. Um, and is intelligent enough to understand what is being done to him. Um, and, and then he, you know, gets like violent bloody revenge by the end of the movie and you don't, you, you're like, yeah, good. <laughs> um, <laughs> Even though, as you say, there's there's like there's a lot of darkness there. This is not this is not all just like these these pure hearted chimps deserve to be free. It's like, well, yeah, but also a lot of them are really angry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and the way the movie films Koba is like he's a he's a, a monster in a horror movie. Mm-hmm. That's times like the like the, the there's there's so many shots in this movie of him just standing there menacingly. I love the 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 moment where he writes the one guy's name on mm-hmm. the board. <laughs> as yeah. he's like writing his list of uh-huh. who he's going after <laughs> it's so good uh-huh. um it, it just like it, it is it is kind of building him up to be this horror movie character and then yeah at the end of it you're like well i mean like i kind of deserved it actually um so i i think it's interesting because i don't think they wrote this movie with the specific plans to sequelize it um but it just feels like that is a moment that's set up for mm-hmm the 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 oncoming conflict between this new society of ape and uh and the, what's what's rem the remnants of the human race which is what the next film is about but mm-hmm. that all seems like more set up than than anything um mm-hmm. because it doesn't necessarily pay off here other than as you said hell yeah go get him Koba he sucks yeah, yeah I, I that's that's such an interesting like observation because the movie didn't like require Koba like yeah Koba and Caesar don't really have a relationship in this movie. Koba is mm-hmm. basically just like, well, it, it, it. I think it's just good storytelling once again to be like, okay, the scientists continue to do their experiments on the chimps in the chimp lab, but we no longer have a, a like a, a, a chimp point of view on this to show what's happening here. And that kind of seems kind of seems like there ought to be. It kind of seems like if we're trying to like humanize these chimps and make them characters. Well, then the ch- the second batch of chimps that they give the intelligence serum to are are you know moral subjects who we should care about. And yeah, but this one, you know, I I think I think again all non verbally. This is what I love is Koba and Caesar are contrasted for us as like Caesar was was raised almost entirely by this loving man who who treated him as as his as a child almost not quite but almost. Um, and Koba was raised in a lab and was brutally tortured for his whole life. And none of this is ever like spelled out to us. We're, we're never directly, you know, told to contrast these two visions of like what it, what, what all of this means. But mm-hmm. that's all it's like, it's like really clear and really obvious. And there, there are moments when they're like in, in the scene together. Um, uh, but it, it's, it's enough to get you thinking, but, like like you said, it's interesting how it works. It works so well as set up, even though I think in this movie it just works to get you thinking about like the context of um of how of, of how a how a person is brought up. Um yeah. what lessons they learn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um gosh, I, I I wish I had more information about like what the plan was. like like I said, I'm pretty sure they they approached about a sequel later and the the director um rupert wyatt the reason he dropped the project is because they set a release date before the script was done and he's like i can't work like this i'm out of here mm-hmm. um but yeah I, I i don't know i i'm really interested in, in these like that's the thing i really love about this is is they spend the time to characterize all these apes like even the ones that don't become intelligent until late in the movie the gorilla the orangutan um even the i think it's what who is the the other ape that it's kind of his his uh antagonist in the reservation it's not he's not a chimpanzee he's a someone's listening screaming the name of the type of monkey at me i I thought he the antagonist in in the reservation yeah i thought he was i thought he was just like a big adult chimp um or 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 is this are we talking about the difference between a a chimpanzee and, and, and a bonobo maybe yeah because i can never tell the difference between them i mean my understanding of a bonobo is that it's basically like a, a chimp subspecies, if if that. But I thought they were just all chimps, to be honest. I, 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 might, this one, this I one guy wrong. looks different. I don't know. He looks a little different. 
he's his fur is different color which means he's a totally different species because that's how fur works right <laughs> right right yeah um yeah, yeah it doesn't matter the, the point is like every single one of those is characterized and as you said like the, the movie does this really almost daring thing where it is about halfway through where caesar gets sent there and we we definitely check in with Franco still throughout the course of that, but the movie really shifts to be Caesar's movie at that point. And yes, has no dialogue essentially for a, a for any of these scenes. I mean, there's a little of uh, subtitles in in some uh, sign languaging, but for the most part, no dialogue, and everything has to be communicated visually. Um, it's completely relying on these motion capture performances and the special effects to capture what is going on and how these apes are reasoning with each other and and what caesar's thinking about and how he's planning and him realizing like the the way to to take command of of this group of apes is so great like i love him giving the the one the cookies and then commanding him to like drop the cookies in each of the trays like it's it's so perfect yeah everything there just and it's it's very well shot too like all this stuff is very well shot i think this is a very well directed movie yeah um considering i don't really know who rupert wyatt is um i was really surprised at how just how good of a movie this was direction wise yeah he hasn't directed anything that i've seen uh, at no all, so. yeah yeah um so again I, I really thought we were gonna have to wait until the second movie in this in this trilogy before i was gonna start talking about how great this all is um and, and it has me so excited because like i do probably think i'm gonna like the next movie better but like that's crazy because i'm starting at such a high point with this thing i think the thing about this movie is it's it's maybe more just sort of triumphant and like badass Mm -hmm. whereas i think the next movie is more sort of fleshed out and tragic and yeah uh, i mean they're they're gonna be really different movies because oh yeah this movie has huge stretches of totally nonverbal storytelling in the next movie everybody can talk um so that's that's just kind of changes the kind of story that you're able to tell sure um it's it's a fun it's sort of a fun writing lesson slash challenge to be like how do you hit a bunch of necessary story beats with characters who can't talk yeah and they they do it so well like i i you know you just talked about the scene where he's he's sort of he bests the other chimp and, and and gives him the cookies to hand out. And it's like, okay, you're, you know, I've, I've laid you low, but I'm not going to exile you. You're, you're my Lieutenant now. And it's, and like, that's, but he, none of that is said. That's just like, here's your job now. You know, it, it yeah. it's great. And, and, and the, the, you know, the, the way that he tricks that chimp and, and it's just like such a badass moment. So many, <laughs> so many great moments of just like, hell yeah. Um, I, I, which is hard it's hard to do it's not that it's hard to do like objectively it's hard to do in a way that doesn't feel sort of indulgent yeah like you really have to earn that you really have to try to get me on the character's side and and the movie spends i think probably more than half of its runtime doing that because you spend all this time really getting to know caesar i think andy circus's ability to convey the emotion through this chimp and the the heartbreak and and loss that this this little guy has gone through gets you to the point where you really actually feel it when uh when when he starts taking control you're you you care you're invested that's the important part and that's i think you know there's nothing i love more than a than a good movie that makes me feel that sense of triumph yeah like i said it has to really earn it first yeah and, and and i i love that it is is willing to go big when it needs to go big with this kind of stuff too like we joked around about um uh the 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 brian cox and tom felton led animal preservation just being like one of the most monstrous places on the history of the planet and like that works for the movie right like it it the movie needs that to happen actually like mm-hmm. this can't just be an animal reserve and his his opponents in there are the other apes that are rejecting him because he's a house ape or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, it has to be like we're going to lean into this is the most horrible place in, uh, on, the, on the face of the planet. And it's going to kind of crystallize Caesar's outlook on I- I- enslavement versus freedom and, and mm-hmm. all these things like we have to lean into it 
um, in this way for a very specific reason. It kind of reminds me, Matt, of uh, Andor, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where we build this prison in in that show, and we lean into just how horrible and monstrous and evil this prison is, um, to to the point where, like, I think you could accuse it of being less than subtle, um, and and kind of, but but and too big, but it's it's so necessary for everything that the movie wants to do to accomplish that. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 funny cuz there's the the Andy Circus connection there too. Yeah, so I, was, I did that on purpose. It's, it's funny. I, I I was I was thinking about how Andy Circus has has become such an important part of my life. <laughs> <laughs> um over 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 the last you know 25 years basically yeah um that just just uh just so great here i mean we, we've already praised him quite a bit uh but I, I i don't know like i guess it's just like he's 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 so i'm not saying anything original here but it's just he's so he's so unique where he can be this little gremlin creature with the totally weird voice in lord of the rings that is just this iconic performance that that nobody else would have done it that way. Mm-hmm. It, 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 you just believe that you believe that this little gremlin guy is real column. It's obviously what I'm referring to. And then over here, he's, a, he's just a chimpanzee. Like it's just a, but he's a smart chimpanzee, but he's still a chimpanzee. Like, I think that's one of the great things I love about this performance is there's these mannerisms and ways of moving his body that are totally, that's a chimpanzee. Yeah. Yeah. But then also, there's the emotionality and the and the thinking but it's still it's not like it you you don't you don't ever see a human through that mask you see you you just believe this you just believe that this is like it's so cool right it's such a such a cool example of what we can do with with technology and and the fusion of technology and and you know human um creativity i i just love like that's one of my favorite things about this movie is the fact that they nail everything about caesar as a as a computer generated character yeah and i don't want to understate like the risk with this here like it's hard for me to imagine being the people making this movie and like you're you're shooting these scenes and you're like kind of hanging on the faith that this is all going to work once Uh the computer part of it is done. Like, I mean, you have a certain amount of trust in Andy Serkis as a performer at this point, right? This is post Lord of the Rings. Like everyone knows how amazing he was. He's got this shit down. He's really, really good at this. And you can probably capture some of that energy in the mocap while you're filming the actual scene, but you're basically rolling the dice on this and saying, yeah, don't worry though. When we, when we put all this together, you're going to believe this is just a chimpanzee and you're going to fall in love with this chimpanzee and you're going to see him, as you said, as a chimpanzee, but you also have to see him eventually as a person. You have to see him as, as regal. You have to see him as a king, essentially as the ruler of this people, these, these apes. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it has to accomplish all of that. And you really don't know if it's going to until you're at the very, very, very end of the process. <laughs> um mm-hmm. it's wild it's no, absolutely you're, wild you're totally right yeah it's it's interesting they they sort of choose to shoot the even the non caesar chimpanzees they they're not quite i, I think it's interesting because i i went and i watched a bunch of youtube videos about apes um because we've been waist deep in apes for the last like two months and, uh-huh. and and i've just like become more curious about apes and it's like you you watch actual like you know movies of the way chimpanzees look and behave and you actually realize like oh you know that in the movie that's not really quite accurate actually mm-hmm. and i'm not saying this to criticize the movie it's actually more like i see what they had to do they had to do a little trick where they they, they kind of make you forget what chimps actually look like and they're like this is this is what chimps actually look like and you're like yeah sure <laughs> <laughs> and, and like like it's not it's not until you go like look at other pictures of chimps that you're like oh right <laughs> that's <laughs> but it's 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 like but there's something like you said like caesar is like noble and regal and and, and like part of you like wants wants to believe that i guess mm-hmm. like they, the the movie makes you want to believe that it's real which i think is, yeah. is a real magic trick i i do think this movie is really interesting because 
I, I came into this conversation ready to say that I think this this is finally the Planet of the Apes movies that like captures accurately what chimpanzees are. Like I, I, all I could think about was our previous conversations when you have the scene where Caesar uh, is mad at that guy for yelling at at uh, John Lithgow and he just like jumps him and then bites his finger off. Uh-huh. Why? Why is he biting his finger off? Because he's a fucking asshole because he's a chimpanzee. Like right. that's what they do. That's what they do. Why, why, yeah, but but you're absolutely right. Simultaneously, like this is definitely a depiction of chimpanzees as we human beings think they are. Uh-huh. Um, like the, we want to personify these things. We want to make them like just, just maybe little, little humans or young humans. Um, and the movie's more than willing to extend that disbelief for you. Like it does that job for you beautifully. And and so, yeah, you're right. You just buy into it. You're just on board and you honestly forget at times that, that these are, animals yeah um, yeah i, I want to be i want to be kind of clear with what i'm saying because i'm not saying like they did a bad job what what i'm saying is they i think they intentionally slightly changed like the the art direction of like we're yeah. going to make the chimps look a little bit more human um mm-hmm. and their faces are going to be a little bit more expressive than a real chimp's face could even conceivably be because the chimps yeah. they, they don't really have their faces just don't quite look like that but again, number one, we don't all know chimp faces well enough to really notice that. And also, <laughs> it's just smart, it's just a smart decision because it lets you see the emotions that are not only on Caesar's face but on on the other chimps as they're having these nonverbal communications. Yeah. Um, so. No, it, you're absolutely right. It's remarkably effective, and it's 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 making a bet. It's it's a bet that you, even if you're a, a chimp expert coming into this movie, you will perhaps brought along for a ride Mm -hmm. in the movie and and just forget or or forgets the wrong word but just buy into this world as they're creating it um Mm -hmm. i mean you do have to do the same thing in the original series right like Mm -hmm. in the original planet of the apes you have to buy into the fact that these are not human beings (laughs) wearing masks that these are supposed to be apes that that wear clothes now um and eventually you just kind of buy into that fact and and live in that world just fine and i think the the cognitive dissonance that we experienced in the film in, in those films was as you, they went further into them the movie started to pretend like they just looked like normal chimpanzees yeah um and right. that and that's and like that's the part where we like well no they clearly don't though like you shouldn't say that because that's not true and that's where i think we started pushing up against the edges of the special effects in that movie um these movies don't have to do that they 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 can't or they Mm -hmm. won't because Mm -hmm. it's not necessary um but i i think you're right i think that there was definitely a conscious effort in the art direction to tweak them a little bit Mm -hmm. um and, yeah, none of and this, it works. Yeah, it works. None of it. This is not at all meant to be a, a criticism. Just an interesting thing that I was noticing as I was, as I was uh, honestly didn't even notice until, like I said, I went and I watched some videos of like ch- chimps in the wild or at the zoo, and was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> <Huh>. <laughs> they tricked me uh, successfully. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, can, yeah. Can we just state for the record that the fact that. Andy Serkis himself doesn't have an Academy Award is like one of the biggest uh, crimes in in cinema. It really is. Um, I don't know. Like I said, he's he's a very unique gift to to cinema. He was a key part of you know, Lord of the Rings, which itself won like every Oscar there was to win. He, mm-hmm. yet, yet he didn't. Um, and, and he's, he's one of the reasons why it was so great, why it worked so well. And, yeah. you know, it's sort of like with this movie, it's like, God, so much rides on so much rides on him in every movie that he does. Right. Like think of like, he's, I, I'm not, I'm not good at sports, but there's gotta be some metaphor for like the guy where it's like, look, this whole movie rides on your ability to do this specific thing to, to be, to be this weird inhuman creature that we don't know if it's going to work or not if it doesn't work everybody's going to make fun of this movie forever and he always pulls it off so yeah he's the role player i mean he's the character actor like he is like i think the perfect modern encapsulation of what a character actor is Mm -hmm. like that this is just what he does and and he's incredibly good at it um Mm -hmm. and 
he's so god he's so weird and like in, in many ways he's like a really weird looking dude but in like and then like he can be in roles and like 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 when he played alfred in the batman movie you're just like yeah 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 i'm there well let's do, let's do it. it it's really fascinating this guy I, I love him a whole lot um i'm so you're, you're absolutely right though it's it's so good that we've got him in our our lives and he's been such a huge part of our movie going experience since since 2001 which yeah. is crazy it's funny like i don't even know if he it, like is he a weird looking guy or is he just really good at holding his face in such strange ways that you think that's what he looks like? Like, I, I guess, think, that, I guess I think that's what it is. Cause like you see him like perform Gollum. Yeah. Like when he's doing it and he like contorts his face in a way mm-hmm. that you're just like, Oh yeah, you're a little gremlin person. Aren't you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it's like, no, he's not. <laughs> he's, he's, uh, but, but he, he can, he has really, it, it is really ironic that like, and, and perhaps necessary that this guy who, is it primarily seen through CG renditions of himself, like is just really good at face acting as at what you call face acting. Like mm-hmm. he's just very good at understanding his face and what his face is doing and how to convey things through that face. Um, mm-hmm. And of course that's, that's the reason is because they mocap that stuff and they're, they're all the stuff is picking up his actual face, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, man. I love it. Um, I just here's here's what I want though, Matt. Mm-hmm. I really just want one Andy Circus playing a digital performance where he doesn't bite someone's finger off. I just like <laughs> want that to happen one time. Uh, the, yeah, did did, did Snoke bite someone's finger off? I think off screen, probably, right? Oh, almost definitely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. I honestly forgot he did. He was Snoke. That's such a non character in those movies. I totally forgot. Yeah, it's it's funny. That's a funny one. If, if this is going to be Andy Circus corner, because like the the requirement of that character is like okay you're you're basically just a super evil dude and you're gonna ham it up and that's that's it that's the instructions Mm -hmm. and he does great there's just not in in neither of the movies in which snoke appears there's just not a lot of like i don't know it's good like he 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 does he does good with it nothing nothing there's no there's no criticism of his portrayal here it's just like that's that's never the performance that comes to people's mind, right? Um, yeah, no. Yeah. That was a flub of the Abrams mystery box nonsense uh, mm-hmm. that that Ryan Johnson clearly didn't even know what to do with, so he just got rid of him. Got rid of him. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it, it's not Circus's fault for sure, right? I mean, I think it's actually. I think the interesting thing about uh, interesting thing about Snoke is. I don't understand why they made Snoke CGI is, is the truth. Mm-hmm. Like it would like, I get that you want to have him have a scarred face, but I'm like, well, why don't you just make him Andy circus <laughs> with makeup? Yeah. Like, like why did he have to have, have uh, uh, like, I, I, I'm honestly confused by this because the whole, the whole first star Wars reboot movie, they were making a big deal out of making things practical, making things look kind of retro, and and you know look like old fashioned Star Wars, and then they have Snoke look the way Snoke looks. I just don't get the yeah. decision. I'm sure there's some thought process here. I just I've, I've always kind of felt it strange. Some of this is I wonder if it's just literally like we have hired Andy Circus, mm-hmm. so he must be CG, um, mm-hmm. which is weird because he's been a lot of characters across several franchises that have not been cg but mm-hmm. um yeah I, I don't know i think this is a good a good question uh that has no answer because he was a, a bad character that died off <laughs> relatively yeah. quickly yeah um uh but apes apes um i wish there so was I, a drug that made us smart i i mean it'd be pretty cool right but maybe it also in the aerosol form uh gives us a horrible flu when we die so worth it <laughs> I don't quite think that's true, Matt. I don't quite think that's true. We're taking a chance. Why? There's so many movies in which we inject smart drugs into the brains of animals in order to cure Alzheimer's, and it blows up in our face. You remember Deep Blue Sea? I do. Remember when we made the shark smarter, Matt? How did that go? Not well for Sam Jackson. (laughs) Not well for any of them. Mm Mm-hmm. I forgot that I think was the only one that gets out of that one. Okay. Is LL Cool J. I think you're right. I forgot that that was another making the animals smart. 
I feel mm-hmm. like there's. I was thinking about the 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 the, the book slash movie Relic recently, which is not quite <laughs> the same thing, but they, yeah, I don't know. I, I I do enjoy the the genre of like smart monsters hunting you. Not not just yeah. monsters hunting you, but like human intelligent monster is is hunting you it's always fun I, I do think one thing that's interesting and this is not a complaint about this movie which i liked very very much but it is interesting to like talk about the just like the, where we were and are in culture that when we're rebooting planet of the apes this time around this is the movie we make. We have to tell the origin story, right? It, mm-hmm. It's like we have to do the prequel first. I think it does reflect like how our our concerns have changed and our our the things we want out of stories have changed over time because like even even now you could make the argument that like how the monkeys took over is actually not the most interesting part about the story like the most interesting part about the the story of planet of the apes is the story when it is already the planet of the apes and and not the story of how it became the planet of the apes mm-hmm. and yet um, and yet that is the story we've chosen to launch this franchise with. And yeah. I, I just think it does absolutely reflect like modern tendencies and desires in these type of stories. We want to see the origin. We want to know how it all starts. We, we need that. Uh, and we need it first. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, also like the, the, hor- the horrifying stinger at the end of the first movie is like, oh my God, humanity has been destroyed. Mm-hmm. And, and then like the, the sort of. Uh, a tempting morsel in this movie is like you want to get to watch humanity be destroyed because that's the fun <laughs> part we all want to see mm-hmm. that because we hate ourselves now yeah um, man, I, I, we I, sure I, do i, I, I maybe I, I may or may not believe that that's the explanation but i, I think i think there's a, <laughs> there's a case for it mm-hmm. um it does make me wonder are we ever going to see the movie that is the remake of planet of the apes like, like, is that going to be like, wouldn't that be sort of cool if they can pull it off? If that were like the final movie of this new apology that we're doing right now? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I, we, the, the one that we haven't seen is the one that came out this year, Kingdom. So maybe that is a stealth version of that. And we just don't know it yet. Um, I will say, I don't know if you, there, there were several, like, we already talked about the most direct references, which is Draco Malfoy saying, get your damn hands off me. Um, mm-hmm. But there are a bunch of other like subtler references mm-hmm. in this movie. I don't know if you caught them all. Um, Probably not Caesar all is playing with the Statue of Liberty toy at one point. Um, there is actually like this multiple recurring beat in the background of this movie about a group of astronauts going into space mm-hmm. and then the spaceship disappears and they can't find them, which I think is supposed to be Taylor and his his crew. Totally. So like, I mean, I, I like. I don't think that's us like playing the long game and setting up an eventual Planet of the Apes reboot. I think that's just them being cute and having fun. Um, but but it's all there, Matt. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I mean, maybe in the back of their mind, they're thinking maybe someday. No, you know what? I, th- I think you're right. Actually, I, I don't think I don't think they were cynically thinking. Yeah, they're gonna. We'll be glad we did this ten years from now. No, I think I think they were just. <laughs> I think they were literally just saying like you know hey this is what we're building toward this is what's mm-hmm. this is where we're gonna go I, i'm not even necessarily saying like I, I need to see this or whatever it's just like that would be kind of cool it would be would be kind of cool to imagine like what what is what is our modern version of that original story which is really a different story where we have a, a person except now he's a person of our time and he's thrust into this ape society and maybe we don't maybe we don't necessarily say exactly the same things like maybe the same the same things don't need to happen where um you know like i think one 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 change we didn't really like in the tim burton movie was that the humans could talk um that seemed like to sort of change the complexion of what we were doing with that story and Mm -hmm. it didn't really it didn't really earn us anything in exchange and but but like I, i mentioned that to say i'm not categorically opposed to the idea of having you know, a remake of that movie where the humans can talk. It's just, then you have to do something interesting with that and, right. And justify that change. Basically. Um, I, I'm, n- I'm not even trying to fixate on that change. I'm just giving an example of the kind of thing that you might want to look at and reconsider, uh, in, in approaching that subject matter again. Um, 
not that it needs to be remade either, but it's like, okay, well, this is kind of what we're doing. Is it, it's almost like, um, <laughs> I was talking with my, my, my mom who, uh, who was the one who showed me the planet of the apes movies originally when I was a kid. And, and she was saying like, yeah, the original movies were all, were all out of order. And, and I was like, I was, I was being a pedantic little shit. Cause that's what you do when you're, when you're a child of a, of a mother. And I was like, <laughs> well, they're in order. They just start in the middle. And then uh-huh. they and then they loop around. <laughs> True, technically. Um, yeah. uh, the, I, I would I would indeed call you a pedantic little shit. Yeah, yeah, uh, of course. You're you you are right on the technicality. They're 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 in sequence. It's just we start in the middle of the sequence, and then we mm-hmm. go to the end of the sequence, and then we go back to the beginning. Um, which it seems like this time we literally we just started at the beginning, and then we're going to go to the end. And by that logic, if you were being if you, if if you were being overly overly sort of literal about the remake it would be like well sort of next we would have taylor's encounter coming back from space to a to a fully apified planet of the apes Mm -hmm. and then we would have the revelation of the mutants (laughs) and then the destruction of the earth and a time travel back in time I, I think yeah, more than seeing the the full remake of Planet of the Apes in this new series, I would want to see what the hell they would do with Beneath the Planet of the Apes. Um, they, uh-huh. I mean, that would have to change so dramatically, but but it would be an interesting change that would re- I think reflect modern times in in a fun way. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, one other thing I was thinking about while I was watching this movie was. I think it's really interesting that one thing that these all like all three versions of this series have in common is they all either eventually in the in the original series or immediately in both the Burton remake and this one get to this this central idea that not only is humanity responsible for our own destruction, but we are also in essence responsible for the rise of the planet of the apes. We we made them this way. Mm-hmm. Um and and therefore we are we it's it's our it's our fault essentially on both sides of it and i think that's really interesting because yes the original series took like three or four movies to get there but i never got the idea when watching just planet of the apes that that was like the point of Mm -hmm. the movie like this idea that yes yes humanity destroyed itself but also like the the this world run by apes in that movie in that movie alone was just like oh well then nature just like took over and and selected a, a new group to become the the civilized intelligent race on the planet and just see, let's see how they do um but but it does it, it is really interesting to me that no matter how long these things go on, they always go back to the apes are smart because we created them that way. Mm. Um, which is, I don't, I don't know ultimately what that says, but I just think that's interesting that that every movie has done this essentially. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, that's interesting. I don't know if I have anything smart to say. I mean, this, the, the science fiction idea of, of like the hubris of trying to create life as, as, as God, um, um, is you know well worn at this point all the way back to the literal origin of sci-fi um, with uh, Frankenstein and, and possibly you know back into into ancient myth right like the the idea of 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 of, of enhancing or you know like the the story of the golem for example I don't mean that golem I mean the 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 Jewish myth. Um, just like we we do seem to be really interested in the idea of like we uh, out of our um overweening desire for mastery over overstep ourselves and mm-hmm. uh, and 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 create something that is as great or greater than us and that is our downfall um we just seem to like that story i guess yeah no i think that's definitely true um i think i think we're just inherently fascinated by the ways in which we both destroy ourselves and create something that that uh replaces us i think it's just really fascinating well also yeah i mean so you when if you say it that way it's like i think the sort of deep psychoanalytical analytical level on which this operates is like yeah uh you have a child and then you die and mm-hmm. and your child's sur- i it's almost it, the, the the weird thing about the human condition is we hope that our child surpasses us in every mm-hmm. way 
that's the best outcome actually is that we are totally outstripped by by the thing that we you know create and are replaced by so it makes sense that we're fascinated with this idea and it, it also makes sense that we have conflict about it because it's like well we don't actually want to die we we so but but, but we have to and yeah and, and there's always going to be tension there mm-hmm. no i like that i like that a lot um i think i <sighs> Now, now all I can think about is like what's going to happen when they reboot this franchise in twenty years, and how, how this is going to reflect everything that we're living through now and then. And oh man, yeah. So, so when you when you you said a second ago that you wanted to see how they portray the mutants, I immediately, I, I probably you know prematurely jumped to an answer, but I was like, I don't actually think it's going to be human. I don't think it's going to be mutants because that was again that was a manifestation of our fear of, of nuclear war. I mm-hmm. think it's going to be like either like cyborgs or like full on AIs, you know, like maybe replicant style, like robots, maybe, um, you know, just just computers where it's like instead of it being instead of it being that there's a there just happens to be a tribe of humans who hid under the ground from the nuclear war and and evolved uh, a, a sort of bi- biological slash radiation induced evolution that made them psychic. It's like, no, no, there's. There's a bunker, that, you know, maybe a bunker of humans who who had you know the remaining AI technology, and now and now it's the AI that is either is either fused with them or taking them over, and and so this is like again, it's a sort of dehumanizing transformation of humankind into something alien and terrifying, mm. such that you know I, I think one thing we said when we were watching that movie, or at least I I think my my position was like these aren't even humans; these are these are a new thing that isn't human because they're mm-hmm. they, they 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 look human but also but actually they don't look human anymore um they just aren't human anymore uh, i think we're i think that's what they would do or that's what i that's that's maybe what i would do i guess i should say because again the reason i say that is it's like well you're speaking to the to the specific concerns of of our modern day um although there's also there's sort of an option b that immediately comes to mind where it's like okay but the genesis of this storyline was bioengineering so you could have the the humans in the bunker have bioengineered themselves intentionally, uh, you know, using retroviruses, you know, w- whatever sci-fi you know concept you want to invoke there. So instead maybe they'll of, be like ape human hybrids. Yeah, they, they or you know so, so, something something that would strike us as as kind of horrifying, um, because that's kind of the point of of the of the mutant characters in those movies mm-hmm. is like. Is like oh my god! Like it would be better for us not to exist than to become this thing. Um, god help me! I want to see that movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, that sounds fun. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I continue to love the just like even the movies I don't like. Even like we didn't like the Burton movie at all. Like there were a bunch of ones and the other ones we didn't like. But I just love this idea. I think it's such a fun core idea. Uh, that it's it's really fun to see it executed in different ways with different ideas and different people and and man i'm really looking forward to the next two movies a lot i actually haven't watched dawn or um uh war since they came out i saw them both once and loved them and then haven't revisited them since so i'm really really looking forward to that me too and i think i've seen dawn once and i don't think i've even seen war and i oh okay yeah, and I didn't watch it uh, when we started the project because I was like, well, I guess I'll just retain my status of not having watched it so that it can be a, a fresh experience. Yeah, no, um, great. I can't wait. Um, I have very little memory of that one. So uh, I know I watched it and I liked it, but I, I don't remember too much of it. So we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, I'm excited. All right. Anything else you wanted to talk about for Rise of the Planet th- of the Apes? I don't think so. I think that that covers it. Um, all right. Next, we will move on to Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. I think that might be next week. Uh, we might also have a a surprise uh, break from that to talk about something else. But I think next week we'll probably do apes, right? Uh, that's uh, I, I believe that is currently what will happen. Yes. OK, cool. All right. Well, before we go, Matt, I just wanted to recommend a movie to you. Uh, one of my favorite movies I've seen this year, although that is such a small list of movies at this point that it really has much less uh much less oomph behind it than it used to. Uh but there's a movie that was released a couple weeks ago on Netflix. It's called Rebel Ridge. And does the name uh, Jeremy Saulnier ring any bell with you? It does not. 
So he directed a film called Green Room in 2015. This is a movie I've definitely talked to you about before. Um, I saw it at Fantastic Fest uh, that year, and uh, it was it, it, starring uh, the the late Anton Yelchin as mm-hmm. a, like a like hardcore punk rocker. Um, basically, the the concept of that film is a, a group of punk rockers are like in, in a band traveling around the the country, like doing gigs and like barely surviving. Like the opening shot of that film is them siphoning gas from another car in a parking lot because they just have no money and they're like barely. So they get this gig. They show up at the gig. It's a bunch of Nazis at, at like a Nazi, like a white power, like neo-Nazi bar. And they're like desperate in need for money. So they're like, oh, fuck it. We'll do it. We'll do the gig. And then they, <laughs> at the end of the gig, they play a, a song called Nazi punks fuck off, which is incredible. But in that movie, um, they're about to leave. One of them goes back into the green room to get something they forgot. And they happen to witness some of the Nazi guys murder someone. And so now all the Nazis want to kill them. And it's basically like a, a single room film where they're stuck in the green room at this, at this bar. And there's a bunch of Nazis outside wanting to kill them. And it's very gory and bloody and incredible. Um, love this guy he shoots very gnarly action films and this new one is a movie called rebel ridge that he did for netflix um it is about a former uh, marine corps guy who uh is traveling to bail his brother out of jail his brother has been pulled over for like a, a a marijuana possession um and he apparently was was state's witness against some gang and so if he gets into the system he's gonna die and so he's like desperately trying to get his brother out of jail is harassed by a cop. Um, and the cop finds his stash of money and, uh, performs a civil, uh, forfeiture and just takes his money. And he's, he's pretty mad about it. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and the movie kind of goes from there. It's, it's really, really, really good. Like, uh, th- this is a guy I, I, I kind of am thinking one day I would like to just do a deconstructing series on, uh jeremy Saulnier because i just really enjoy every single one of his movies i think this hits movie five for him and i think five is our our minimum so like we're just about there with this guy if we want to do it someday but man um this is a a very very sharp tense well-told film uh it, it stars a man named aaron pierre who i had never heard of before uh apparently he's playing the voice of mufasa in the Mufasa sequel that's coming out later this year and he was he was mid-sized sedan in old is the one place I've seen him by the way gotcha. um, but he is like just an out of the gate action star like just like a fully formed you've never seen a guy in this role but he has such presence such like you can just stand there and be intimidating as hell such like control of himself in this really like addictive to watch way and he he takes what is a, a good movie and and like elevates it to this wonderful 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 just ride um it's like a, it's a netflix movie that's good matt that's why i'm that's why i'm talking about it because it's a really good netflix movie and i can't believe it it's so good so i should uh, watch this with my kids then or uh, definitely not okay. although I, I would say it's not as violent as you think it would be based on my uh uh, description of the type of thing this guy normally does definitely has violence in it it's not quite as gross out violent as some of that other stuff has been but um gotcha it, it, it's cool. it's really good yeah i mean you that's that's a great that's a great pitch um i will try to find the time for it sounds sounds fun it's been a while since i watched just like a solid fun action movie uh, which mm-hmm. is what this sounds like um, yeah oh man like Aaron Pierre, I need to see more of this guy. He's so good. Who who knew that mid-sized sedan would be <laughs> an action star? Yeah, that's interesting. I I barely remember that character. I mean, we did watch that movie, but only the one time. So yeah, I mean, he's just not like he's just not that big of a character yeah. in that movie. Like he's like he, he's basically what he is is the joke that his name is mid-sized sedan, and that's like what he primarily serves as. But uh, yeah. And I seem to remember that's a very like muted performance too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he he's done some other things. Like I think he has some stage experience um, in in uh, London because all the good actors are from England now. Apparently, um, he's doing an American voice in this. But um, 
Yeah, very convincing American voice, by the way. He's, he's, these these British actors are so damn good at our accent. It's not fair. Yeah, it's it's always funny to me um, to, mm-hmm. to 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 realize this happens so many times in one's life. You realize that an actor is British that you didn't realize beforehand. Yeah. So yeah, that is Rebel Ridge available now on Netflix. Really, really strongly recommend it, um, and strongly recommend that y'all just check out all of of Jeremy Saulnier. I think Matt, if you like this movie and watch it, maybe I'll say, hey, let's just kick off a, a deconstructing Saulnier at some point in the future. Yeah, yeah, I, I I think I'd be down for that. I mean, I don't, I'm not as much of a gore hound, but I can, I can, you know, I, I here's the thing, I like, I like action movies, and. I don't mind it when people get horribly butchered. I just don't want them to suffer. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't like that. I don't like, I don't like like torture violence. I like action violence. It's totally different things. (laughs) Well, you know, you know, there's a little uh, column A (laughs) and a little uh, column B. All right. All right. All right. Um, Yeah. I I don't want to spoil these, these films completely for you because. I, I hope you will watch them one okay. day, but there's 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 some of both of those things for sure. OK. Uh, all right. That was short and sweet, but I just definitely wanted to. It's it's rare I get to talk about a movie I've watched on the show that isn't one we're doing for the main show. So I want to take advantage of that. Yeah. Awesome. All right, folks, that's all we had for you this week. If you have any thoughts on Rise of the Planet of the Apes or on the works of Jeremy Saulnier, if you if you watched Rebel Ridge based off that recommendation, let me know what you think. Let me know if you enjoyed it. Uh, you can reach out to us via email at doofmedia at gmail.com on our X account at doofmedia or over on uh, the Reddit. That's r slash doofmedia. Yeah, and if you're not already subscribed to the Doofcast, we encourage you to do so and ensure you never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, YouTube, and pretty much anywhere else podcasts can be found. If you like what we do here and want to support us, please consider becoming a patron of Doof Media. You can head on over to patreon.com slash doofmedia and join us at any of the available ranks. You get a whole bunch of bonus episodes. You get to vote in monthly book clubs, which a vote for that will be coming up shortly in just a few days, I think. Uh, you just get a whole bunch of bonus stuff and you get to help us out. Uh, so if you if you want to do that, please consider it. Uh, we really appreciate all of you that uh, that are active patrons um, or or future patrons. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Uh, also, please consider rating and reviewing the Doofcast on Apple Podcasts. Every review helps us get more exposure and introduces new people to the content that we make here. That is right. We will really appreciate that. And please be on the lookout. We've got a new show coming up, Matt, in just a few months. Um, have we? we don't, I don't think we've actually talked about that on on this podcast yet, have we? I think you're right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we are we are wrapping up our series on Stephen King in just a few weeks now, and we're going to be beginning a series on the the films and television of Mike Flanagan. So I think that aligns. If if you're listening to this, you probably also appreciate the films and television of of Mike Flanagan. Uh, so if you're not a if you haven't been following us because of you're not that into Stephen King, uh, but you like horror movies and horror television shows. Uh, might be time to keep on the lookout for that. It's called Flanagan's Wake, and it's going to be kicking off in January. Uh, it's going to be so much fun. We we can't wait. We can't wait. Yes, I am very excited about that. All right, folks. Next week, dawn of the planet of the apes of the mat. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next week. <laughs> And you'll do what I say. Woof, woof. My name is Doof, and you'll do what I say. Woof, woof.